John Blanding, alcoholic. Amen. Pardon my stepping here. I got a hip like uh, Tom got knees. I had hips that way. And uh, so I'm, <laughs> I'm getting there, though. And I want to thank Fern for reminding me the other night that I had, uh, Tom had asked me to be here tonight. And, uh, and I was concerned about the weather, but it was, like she said, it was nice down here and it was real nice up in Fayetteville. So I didn't call back. I told her I'd call back if I thought the weather might be bad, but it was real nice. And uh, my home group is Central Group in Fayetteville. And like Wallace said, I've been here before. The first time I came here, though, it was uh, meeting downstairs or something up, up front. And uh, I had, you know, I'm new in AA. I don't want to be late going to Wallace's meeting. And so I left home early and went down in Southern Pines and got me a bite to eat and came on back, said, well, I'll wait until, you know, till they start coming in. And I was at the church in the next block <laughs> And I'm sitting there waiting. I say, good grief, look like they'd be coming in by now, you know. It's 8 o'clock. <laughs> and so I got up and uh, asked the guys in the NA meet, uh, uh, AA meeting there. He said, no, sir, that might be the next church up. I don't know. And so I came up, and, and Wallace had somebody up there up at the speaking and so I came in and the guy went and sat down and I, I talked about 15 or 20 minutes. Boy, 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 that was, that was rough. But uh, I, uh, I'm not a joke teller, you know, but I like, I like when, uh, you know, speakers tell jokes. I really enjoy that, you know, because I love jokes. But when I get up here, it's just, that's the least thing on my mind is a joke. But I've told a jo I told one joke twice. <laughs> one, the last two times I spoke, I told that same joke twice. And I said, well, I'm not going to tell the same one this time, but I want to tell a joke. So uh, that was this, this uh, couple that was having marital problems, and so they went to see a counselor. And uh, they sat down, and boy, he asked her how it was going, and she just yak, 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 about four or five minutes, and he got tired of hearing, and he jumped up and grabbed her and kissed her real hard and told my man, say, uh, now that's all she needs. No, she needs that about three times a week. <laughs> he said, uh, and, and can you do it? Can you take care of that? She just needs it three times a week. He got up and he said, well, say, I could get it on, I could bring her here on Monday and Wednesday, but Friday I go fish her. <laughs> I could bring her here on Monday and Wednesday, but Friday I go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I like to die when I read that out of the great band. <laughs> so that's an AA joke. <laughs> okay, like I'm from, I'm not from Fayetteville. Uh, Wallace and Tom, they mention top soldier, top soldier. And, and uh, corrections start calling me that, corrections. Not my home group or district or nothing, but when I get to corrections, they call me that. And, uh, and I, I enjoy it, I guess. But uh, I'm, I'm not from North Carolina. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm retired military, and I spent most of my career at Fort Bragg. That's why I'm still here. My wife passed in 98. But this is, she was from Fayetteville, and that's where we bought a home and everything. That's where the children grew up, so that's why, well, they're all gone, but I'm still there. And I, and I, love, uh, I love being around the military base, you know. It's very, very convenient for me. But anyway, I, uh, from Birmingham, 
And, and one thing, it, it was hard for me to, to, to believe that I was an alcoholic because step one, when I read step one of uh, uh, the steps, said uh, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. And shoot, I know that couldn't be me, you know, because I'm from Birmingham, I'm from 12th Street. And uh, they called me Top Soldier. If you're from my home group, you know about 12th Street. 12th Street, is, Birmingham is a pretty big city. And uh, 12th Street is the only dirt street I ever saw in Birmingham. Only dirt street. I've seen some dirt alleys, et cetera, but, that, but avenues and streets were all paved except 12th Street. And trains ran up and down 12th Street not the slow trains all the time. Sometimes, though, they wasn't stopping in Birmingham by there, going real fast. And uh, across the street was a plant, a plant. And so that's where I grew up. And when I joined AA, I was living in a four-bedroom brick house, big, nice, pretty lawn and all that stuff. And my life couldn't have been unmanageable from 12th Street to there, you know. But I tell you, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't a piece of cake getting there now. It wasn't a piece of cake getting there. When uh, my father came back from World War II, he was in the Navy in World War II. When he got back, uh, he was going to the school, under the, going to take up tailoring under the GI Bill. And uh, one day, it was check day, and him and mom went to the store that we got stuff on credit from until check day. And, uh, and so they went to the store and I was on the front porch swinging my little sister, my little sister. And I got up and walked through the house and I saw the check in there on the, on, in the middle room. Wasn't no living room and all that stuff. It was the front room, the middle room, and the kitchen. And uh, in the middle room was the check. So I uh, went back on the front porch and shortly I saw my father coming from that way and he got up on the porch and they all, everybody called me John Edward. All the grown-ups called me John Edward back then. And uh, he said, John Edward, I forgot to check. I said, yeah, daddy, it's in the middle room on the, on the shelf, in the, the mantle in the middle room. So he went in there and stayed a few minutes and came back out. Well, the store was in that direction and uh, downtown was in that direction. And he went in the direction toward downtown. And I was eight years old. The next time I saw daddy, I was 33. I was 33. So he, he, had, he had left us. Well, uh, we got on welfare, number one, got on welfare, and my mom started uh, catching the bus to go clean up somebody's house for a dollar. That's what it was, this was 46 now, so I guess a dollar was decent wages in the back then. And she started selling booze, and I don't remember anything about any booze till that time. She started selling booze. And I don't, rem I, I, it puzzles me why I d don't remember anything about any booze until mom starts selling it. Because I found out, well, we call selling booze a liquor house. That, well, we call it a liquor house. And so I grew up in a liquor house. Well, uh, found out every third or fourth house was a liquor house. <laughs> 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 and I didn't know it, because the way I found that out, because I'm the oldest. I'm the oldest of my sisters and brothers, and my mom would say, John Edward, take this pint of gin round to Miss Mary until I say thank you. She had borrowed a pint of gin. I'll go round to Miss Ann's house until I want to borrow a pint, of, a pint of vodka till Saturday. You know, and I, I found out where all the liquor houses was because I was the runner. And, uh, but I, would I didn't want to mess with that stuff. 
I didn't want to mess with that stuff. And had you been there at my house on Friday and Saturday, you wouldn't probably be here either. Because I tell you, I just knew I'd never drink no booze after the way they acted on, on the weekend in my house. But boy, I, I stayed away from it. But my best friend in the neighborhood, my best friend growing up, they live around the corner from me, and his father had, I mean, his mother had left them, and his father sold booze. When I was, and I'm growing up now, and I'm not messing with no booze, I get 16 years old and go around this house, and I forget whether it was a pint or a fifth or what, but I know he had a bottle of liquor. And I had never messed with any, but I tasted it that day. And I got another taste. And boy, I got, got so many tastes, they had to send for my brothers. I, like I said, I'm the oldest, but next under me is uh, two boys that are twins. And we're all about the same size, but I'm a year and eight months older than them, so they had to go get them to take me home. And when I got home, I passed out. And when I came to, it was still daylight, still daylight. And I just, I'm wondering how in the world could I be living, feeling like this? You know, I just know I'm supposed to be dead, feeling like this. You know, and that was a hangover. I didn't know nothing like that could exist. And, uh, I said, now I know I'll never mess with it now. I know that. And I don't remember if it was three weeks or three months or whatever before I took the next drink. But um, um, uh, from that next drink, after that hangover, to right this minute, I've never had enough to drink. Never had enough to drink. I have, of course, I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't quit sometime. I had to quit sometime. First of all, I didn't have no money, to, enough money to get drunk. And then uh, either they sold out, the liquor house sold out, or I got drunk and got kicked out, or whatever. But I never stopped drinking because I had enough. Never. I didn't think, I don't think anybody did that I know of. We had to go. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, when I got 17, I joined the Army. Joined the Army. My buddy, he wanted to join the Army, so we joined the Army. And boy, we in the Army there in basic training at Fort Jackson, and the sharpest soldier I'd ever seen jumped up on the stage. We was in a, in a classroom, jumped up on the stage and said, you can go airborne and jump out of planes and get $55 a month. And what shape I was in, you know, what kind of shape I was in uh, financially. Mom making a dollar, catching the bus to make a dollar, selling booze on welfare, and I'm the oldest. When I joined, uh, base pay was $78 a month. $78 a month. But that wasn't too bad. I joined in 1955, May of 1955, and uh, $78 wasn't too bad because they gave me a sack full of clothes and, and, and three pair of shoes, a couple of hats, you know, shoes, uh, three meals a day, nice bed to sleep in, shoot, I didn't need but $78 a month. And, uh, but, Oh, Sarge would take us to the PX or the, something to get us a haircut and some shaving cream, whatever. And everybody had some money but John. You know, I didn't have no money. So what I done, I just, I just hooked up with the guys that didn't have to, that wasn't sending mom no allotment. That's who I hooked up with. If you sending mom allotment, you know, I'll see you later. If you are not sending mom no allotment, let's, let's hang. And so I could drink. I could drink a little more because they could buy a little more. 
the 11th Airborne Division at Fort Campbell, that's where I was, 11th Airborne Division at Fort Campbell, and they was getting ready to go to Germany under gyroscope for three years and come back. And uh, I got, the, I finished jump school in, in October of 55, and they were going to Germany in January 56. And I'm in bad shape, you know, financially, I'm in very bad shape. And we finna go to Germany. They was letting us go on pass, you know, for, not a pass, but on home on leave about a week before we went over. And you know, I ain't got no leave money in my pocket. But they was letting us, those who wanted to come back with the unit, re-enlist. Now remember, I, I, I came in in May 55. They were going over for three years, going over in January 56, coming back in January 59. So I would have came back before they came back. I would have got out of the army in May of 58. So they were letting those that wanted to come back with the unit re-enlist. I could care less about the unit, but I wanted some money to go home on leave. And then all I had to figure out what I was going to re-enlist for three years or six years. And I think I'd rather go home with, with, with uh, and my pay I went up to $85 a month. Now I'm a private E2. Well, I want to go home with three times 85 or six times 85. <laughs> that wasn't no, not, not no hard decision to make. I went home and got broken three or four days, and we went to Germany, and good grief. Remember, I hadn't got, never, hadn't got drunk yet, because I couldn't afford to get drunk, except when I was home on leave now. Except when I was on leave, I, oh yeah, I got broken three or four days, so you know I got drunk. But got to Germany, and we went to Munich, Germany, one of the biggest cities over there. It was real nice. And, uh, I remember now I'm getting jump pay now, 55, I'm getting overseas pay. That was $9 a month back then, probably 50 now, but $9 a month, but that was good money now in January 56. And uh, that's around there and got over there and booze was two Dutch marks a pint, and that's 50 cent, 50 cent a pint. And so I, now I can afford to get drunk. <laughs> but we, uh, and remember, don't, don't forget, I've never had enough to drink. You know, don't forget that. And I uh, messed around there and was able to sell some cigarettes too. You know, we got uh, ration cigarettes, and I think I got seven or eight cartons a month or something. But we could sell them for a Dutch mark or a dollar a pack or whatever. You know, we could make some money there. So I could afford to get drunk. And, but we couldn't go on past but every other night. See, we're close to Russia, and there was a Cold War going on. We couldn't be out no two nights in a row. We only 50% could be out at a time. And so I wanted to be out there every night. You know, I got this money in my pocket now. And uh, I guess some of those clerks were sending their mom some allotments too because they started selling passes. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and I forget whether they cost $5 or $10, but you know John bought him one. And uh, so I was out there every night, every night. And now I can't figure it out myself. Now, I got the, pa the phony pass in February, and it was in April before I got caught, and I ain't never had enough to drink. So you, boy, how I've how I done that beats me. But uh, when I did get caught, I'm coming back through the gate, and, and they said, uh, call my unit and say, come and get this yo-yo down here. He acting a fool or whatever. And they said, no, it couldn't be blending. He's not on pass tonight. 
<laughs> they came and got me and the commander charged me with illegal possession of a military document. Gave me a special court martial. So he could have gave me a general court, court martial with six years in prison, all that stuff. But since that was my first offense, he was giving me a special course martial. All I could get was, the most I could get was six months in the stockade and stuff. But I was a, I was a top soldier. I was a top soldier. I have really, there was no soldier that was uh, dressed sharper than me and there was not a soldier that could perform better than me. Might have been someone every now and then just as good, but never anybody better than John. I was a top soldier. So, and when I went to get the court martial, my squad leader and my platoon sergeant told that court martial board just what I just said. And they uh, judge, uh, the judge, the, the senior colonel, I think it was a lieutenant colonel, he uh, gave me, I forget what it was now really, but something like uh, a fan or something. They'd give me no restriction or nothing, you know. And so I said, I learned one thing. I'm not going to mess with no phony passes anymore. I'm going to jump the fence like the rest of these children. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 hey, and I started jumping the fence. And, and, and we, on the fence, we had armed guards with live ammunition and stuff, you know. And I never did get caught. Now, I could see getting out, but how in the world I kept getting back in without getting caught beats me. Because I don't remember getting back in a lot of times. <laughs> But anyway, remember, I went over to, to, to re-enlist so I could come back with the unit. I got that court-martial. That was my first offense in April of 56. That summer, the commanding general said we were raising so much sand over there. He said, three convictions and you're out of here. It could be three Article 15s, three court martials, whatever, but any three convictions and you're out of here. And on the parade field, I could see my partners once a week getting on that bus with their duffel bags, you know, my drinking buddies. They couldn't, they wasn't as sharp as me. Couldn't perform as well as I could. <laughs> getting on that bus. And, and, uh, Every time I got court martial on Article 15, my man, my squad leader and platoon sergeant would say how good a soldier I was, and they would, you know, give me, let me slide, not let me slide now, but I would, you know, I, I, I wasn't getting kicked out, didn't get kicked out. I uh, did go before the board to be kicked out. And that was a 208 discharge, I think it was, undesirable. But the, after the, the colonel heard what the squad leader and platoon sergeant said, he said, okay, drive on. I said, okay, sir, thank you. And, and I remember now, I went, coming back with the unit, I went over private E2. Stayed three years and came back with the unit of Private E1. Three years. <laughs> I had four court marshals and five Article 15s and didn't get kicked out. So I with that top soldier stuff, I'm not kidding about that. Got back, we left Fort Campbell and came to Fort Bragg because they had put the 101st at Fort Campbell. And uh, got back and there was no gate at Fort Bragg, no bed check at Fort Bragg, none of that stuff. And here I got all nine convictions for it. And, uh, but I was good to go though, you know, no, just, just perform and go on past when the flag go down, you know. And so I was good to go. But, and, and we could get cars now, 
could buy automobiles now. Of course, you know I couldn't get one because I'm paying fines and stuff. <laughs> but uh, so now I got to look out for not nobody not getting no uh, uh, sending mom no allotment or whatever. I'm gonna look, get the pr whoever get the prettiest car. That's gonna be my partner. And uh, one of my my buddies, he got a a, a, a red convertible Buick. And boy, we were looking good when we went to town. <laughs> we met two college girls down there at Fayetteville State that summer, and uh, we started dating them. My wife, um, <clears throat> she became my wife, but my girl, she had to be in. We were grown now. I'm 21. She's 21. But her family was religious. She had to be in the house at 11 o'clock. And, and so we dropped her off at 11, and that's when we started drinking, you know, after 11. And, and my buddy's girl, she didn't have to be in. So she saw us getting down a few times. And uh, so after a year or so, you know, I said, well, baby, you want to get married? You know, she said, of course. My man, Gert asked his lady, she said, no way, buddy. No way. <laughs> so what I done, I got married so I could take my wife to Europe, you know, let her see Europe. <laughs> Private blending, you know, show his wife Europe. <laughs> and uh, I went over, re-enlisted to go back to Germany, and uh, I left in October 60. She, she couldn't go back. She finished school and, and started teaching in September of 60, but she had to teach in North Carolina one year before she could leave, you know, so she done that. When I went back over there, man, by myself, I was doing the same thing I was doing those other three years, but every time I report to the commander, he would say, I see you're a married man, and I don't want to hurt your family. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and, and, and so that's how, how I made it until she came. But I was an E-4 when I went back. E-4. Stayed three years and came back in E-4. I didn't get reduced because, like I say, I had the family, and that was holding me up. And, 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 and that performance, that performance. Got back to Fort Bragg in 63, and... Uh, I'm still, I'm an E4, you know, and I'm, I'm an airborne infantry E4. The shop is E4. <laughs> the best performing E4. And the average soldier, like I just mentioned, in the infantry would make sergeant in, in three years. But the way I was, the kind of soldier I was, I would make it in less than three of what I've been describing myself as. But now I've been in the army over eight years now. And I'm still, I ain't know nothing about no liquor. And drunk, getting drunk all that, I ain't mentioned drinking, but boy, you, can, you know I was drinking, getting in all that trouble and stuff. Nobody never mentioned no drinking to me. Every time I get a, you know, a punishment, they I say, thank you, sir. You know, they just whip it on me. They don't say mention no drinking. And so I didn't, I know I didn't have no problem drinking. Like I told you when I first got up here, I couldn't have. I'm, you know, I'm from 12th Street. And now I'm, you know, doing okay, you know. Doing okay, sending mom an allotment and still putting a few dollars in my pocket now. And, and my, got my, my wife teaching school. We got back to Fayetteville. She teaching. We doing okay. And I'm an E-4, but I've been in the Army eight years, a little P E-4 pay going up, you know, doing all right. And uh, remember earlier, I couldn't get no car. But now... We can get something, get something cheap, but we can get one. 
And so we got a car. And that started, you know, the, the, no more court marshals and all that 15s. But downtown, <laughs> D, the DWIs or, or whatever, you know, I'm driving now. And I never, I never stopped drinking and driving. I got six DUIs or whatever you don't want to call them. I got six. And, 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 and I, uh, every time I, you know, when I was getting them, though, I got the first one in 64, the last one in 74. And then if you get an attorney, he could get it changed to careless and reckless driving. You go in there and pay the fine and cost of the court and go on back to the club. That was, and that was my situation. And drinking wasn't no big thing, really, in, in, the, the, in that night then, because I saw the division sergeant major in court a couple of times. <laughs> and and uh, he, he's dead now, but he, everybody knew him. He was something else. And uh, I, my, my wife done well with the children. You know, well, I didn't mention children, but my, when we were over in Germany, got that, my wife got over in 60. In 61, my daughter was born over there, and, and she came back with us in 63. In 69, my son was born in, in Fayetteville. So they are in, uh, my daughter's in Birmingham now. She retired from Florida teaching at a college down there. She moved to Birmingham where my family is. My son is still down there in Florida because the police won't let him go. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I messed around there and, and uh, you know, didn't, didn't do any family raising at all. The wife did, she. She kept everything squared away. I thought I was, you know, doing it. But I was, I was doing, she was doing everything. Like, uh, when I come in, I don't remember getting home and stuff. And, 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 and she would just, you know, hustle and hustle and, and, and wake me up and stuff and, and get me in the shower. And boy, once I get out of that shower, I was ready to roll that sharp soldier again, you know. But boy, she had to do it. She had to do it. I remember one day when I was a platoon, platoon sergeant, the first sergeant was having a meeting with the platoon sergeants, and I sat up there and fell out the chair. <laughs> having a meeting and fell out the chair. But uh, I uh, got selected for, for for drill sergeant duty in 74. I was selected for drill sergeant duty. And I didn't want to be no drill sergeant. I don't want to be anything that was not airborne. I've been jumping forever. Spent two years in Vietnam. Two years in Vietnam. But anyway, I'm, I'm airborne. I don't want to be no drill sergeant. But I, DA wouldn't let me out of it. Wouldn't let me out of it. So I would, uh, got at Fort Polk, Louisiana, December 74. And uh, about two weeks later, here come the E-8 list. And my name is on it with an asterisk by my name. And an asterisk meant to be first sergeant. To be first sergeant. So, uh, I had that list came out before I left, I wouldn't have had to leave because ain't no, you know, drill sergeant, the first sergeant be no drill sergeant. And so, but the sergeant major called me over and said, well, Sergeant Blending, uh, you don't have to go to drill sergeant now because you're going to have a company. And I said, well, Sergeant Major, I, I, I'd rather go on to drill sergeant school because the, the, the drill so I'll be, you know, in the company, be drill sergeants, and I want to be just as, you know, professional as they are. And that's, uh, that's that 
performance, uh, you know, we've been talking, and I've been that way uh, all the time. If I wasn't drunk, I was that way. And, and, it, and it paid off, it paid off. And uh, so I was, a, uh, became a, a, a first sergeant after I get out of drill sergeant school. About, remember I said that last DWI was in 74, but it was in the spring of 75 before I, in an action came because I was in drill sergeant school and stuff. And so when action came down, the, the post commander, two-star general, he, his policy then was anybody to get a DWI would go to detox for two weeks. And so I had to go to detox for two weeks, first sergeant blending. By the way, the, uh, the commanding general he would, I don't guess he saw my, my stuff didn't probably go over his desk. Maybe none of this stuff went to his desk. That was just his policy. But anyway, when I got there, I saw who the post commander was, and I went up to see him because when he was a colonel, he was one of those guys that thought I was, you know, that uh, just like my platoon sergeant squad leader said. That's what he thought. And so I went up to see him. We talked about jumping and all that stuff. And uh, I went on to, you know, and went to drill sergeant school or whatever. And when I got out of, while I was in, in detox, that's when the action, the, the paperwork came down. Not the paperwork, but uh, we got a new brigade commander a new brigade commander, and he wanted to see all the first sergeants and above. First sergeant, sergeant majors, company commanders, battalion commanders, he wanted to see them. And he saw them all but first sergeant blending, because he was in detox. <laughs> when when uh, the company commander came over and said, uh, first sergeant, the new brigade commander want to see you, you know, since you wasn't at the meeting we had, I said, okay, sir. And when the, the, my time was up, the company commander picked me up and took me to the colonel's office. <clears throat> and I reported to the colonel, and he had master jump wings on, and I had master jump wings on. And he just talked about jumping for two or three minutes and said, first sergeant, give him hell. <laughs> and, I, and I went to the club that night and gave him hell. <laughs> and gave him hell. And uh, they closed the training center, and they sent me back to Germany. And my wife had been teaching the same place so long, and remember, I got two children now, and we in that four room brick, four brick, four room, four bedroom brick house with the nights pretty long. So she didn't want to rent that, so I just went unaccompanied for two years, and. Uh, since if my family had went, it had been three. But without the family, it was two. And so I went back to Germany. And uh, after one year over there, I called the Department of the Army and said, what are my chances of coming back to Fort Bragg? They said, first sergeant, we have you scheduled for Fort Hood, Texas. I said, OK, thank you. Now, I could, I know rank, but it just didn't dawn on me to come back to Bragg and get some rank to get my stuff changed for me. So I said, I'll just get out. I retired and got in the postal service, which was, you know, okay. Uh, money was okay. My wife still working and everything. Doing okay, maturity. Still drinking, though. Still drinking. Nobody still, though, haven't mentioned any drinking to me. I'll bet your money that my wife did but I don't recall her ever. <laughs> you know, I had to be under the influence when she did, because I don't remember her, and I'm kidding. I, I mean, I'm not kidding. I don't remember her ever mentioning that to me. And so, my 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 daughter, she uh, 
went to Fedford State like her mother did, and she got a fellowship, to, a academic fellowship to Ohio State University for her grades, you know, and stuff. And then my son, he, he didn't get a scholarship from high school, but, and he was not in ROTC, but then you could take a, an exam or a test or something for it, and if you done well enough, that you could, they would give you a scholarship. And he done well enough to get one from the Army and the Navy, the Air Force didn't give him one. He chose the Navy and he chose Hampton University. He done well his first year, but his second year, he, he, he got flaky. And uh, I'm laying up there with a hangover one day and they call and ask me, where was he? I said, he's up there. I said, no, he's up here sometime, but most of the time he's not. He got kicked out and uh, he's my dependent. I got him into treatment. And that's when I saw the steps. I'm powerless over there, cause no way. Uh, came to believe a power greater me could restore me to sanity. I not, nobody never mentioned no <laughs> sanity to me, you know. And uh, made a decision to turn will and life over to care of God as we understood him and stuff. And I've been a Baptist ever since my mama said we Baptists, so I had to be good to go. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And so I couldn't be no alcoholic. But when my son got out of uh, treatment, they suggested a meeting, uh, uh, 90 meetings in 90 days. And just like I said a few minutes ago, I had never done anything fatherly. I know that. The least I can do now is, is uh, support him so I'll go with him to one meeting a week for support. And so I chose the Sunday night speaker meeting at Central Group. Since I wasn't no alcoholic, it was an open meeting, so I could go to that one. And, and uh, I went there, and these people were standing up there talking all this stuff. I said, good grief, I better lighten up on my drinking before I become an alcoholic. <laughs> because I knew I wasn't one. And uh, that's around there, and, and, and after about a month, I said, good grief, I was trying to can't lighten up. I'll just, you know, uh, quit. But I, I won't quit tonight. I'm gonna quit when something happens. Quit when something happens. And now five months went by before something happened. And I said earlier, I never stopped drinking and driving. Never. Until I joined AA. Until I joined AA. And uh, what, what, what happened is, I'm, I'm back to liquor house now. Remember, I grew up in one, but boy, I tell you, after I made sergeant in the army, no more liquor houses for me. I was a club man. You know? <laughs> But I had, I had one, one postal partner, you know, we was getting our work that morning. He just insisted I go to the liquor house with him. So I did, after a lot of begging, I went to the liquor house with him. And good grief, what the world I had, had I been waiting for. At the club, I was just another cu customer. But at the liquor house, I was a big shot. <laughs> Every time I walked in there, I had money in my pocket. Get up and give John a seat. That's what I heard every time I walked in there. And so I, you know, so I, that, that's when I joined AA. After that, I said, well, I said I was going to join. When something happened, I'll join. And I joined, in, uh, I, and I've been going to meetings on a regular basis ever since, ever since I never did. Like I hear some people say meeting will burn them out, but the liquor house burnt me out. And uh, messed around there and couldn't, uh, I said, 
I said, if I get off my train of thought, I'd start over. That's what, <laughs> that's what Buck from Charlotte say, but it's still too late to start over. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I, started, I was going to meet on a regular basis, and after about four months, I got me a sponsor. They kept on talking about sponsorship, but I didn't need no sponsor, but if that's what AA wanted, I could get me one too, you know. So I got me a sponsor. And I'm grateful for a whole lot of things. The thing I'm most grateful for is I don't drink. The second thing I'm most grateful for is my sponsor. I can read, but I could not understand that stuff. And I, I told you about the steps. It, a whole lot of that stuff is just like the steps. It, it might make sense to, to have them, but it didn't make no sense to me. You know, how in the world am I powerless over alcohol? I'm this, 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 this. No way. But anyway, uh, my sponsor, he was, the, he was the GSR of the Fort Bragg group. And, of course, he had to go to district meetings and stuff. And so he would ask me, John, I'm going to a meeting uh, Sunday. You want to go? How in the world can I say, no, I don't want to go to some AA stuff. You know? I said, yeah. And I went with him, man, and I saw these people in AA. Just, I mean, you talked about acting with manners and all this stuff. I just couldn't believe it. I, I'm so grateful that I became an alcohol. I mean, that I joined Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know what to do. And I hear a lot of people say they are uh, grateful to be an alcoholic. And I guess I am too, because I sure wouldn't have you people as friends. And by the way, speaking of friends, about out of time here, but uh, speaking of friends, they said don't put anybody on a pedestal. And you don't have to put no hero or friend on no pedestal. But a hero introduced me tonight. And, and, and his sponsor is a hero of mine. And they are friends of mine. Boy, boy, boy. Here I am with 25 years of sobriety. And one got 51 years, the other one got 58 years. And they are friends of mine. When I first heard them speak, I never thought I'd even know them, see them again, let alone become friends. But boy, I tell you, I'm an alcoholic named John. <laughs>